Hello, I'm Peter Deegan. I'm the RSSL lead tutor for our auditing suite of courses, and I'm delighted to be able to do another podcast in our auditing series. And today I'm welcoming Adam Slater, who's uh, our newest tutor on the lead auditor course. Uh, We're halfway through the auditing course this week. The delegates have got a big audit to do tomorrow and present back. Uh, So we just thought we'll take some time to uh, interview Adam and and learn your auditing journey, really. Welcome, Adam. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes. Well, where do I start? Well, I, I suppose I start because I really didn't ever intend to become an auditor and literally fell into it at the beginning of my career. And I suppose my career really took off when I moved from the health service into private industry into a company where there was an awful lot of manufacturing that was done at external contract manufacturers. It used to be called third parties in those days, just to blur the, the terminology a little bit. And because of my experience in laboratories and experience in QA, I just got handed the task of performing the external audits in these facilities and writing the quality agreements with them. So with only very minimal training really in in internal auditing and no external training whatsoever, I was really thrown in at the deep end. So how did you learn your auditing trade then? Did you just make it up as you went along? Did you have a mentor? Was it the hard way or the easy way? It was the north face of the Eiger, to be honest with you, Peter. I I had no mentor. Um, There's very little reference uh, and guidance back at Back then, we were talking about the 80s, the the mid 80s, and I just had to rely on my common sense and instinct. I I knew the guidelines that were in place at the time, the rules and guidance that were in place in the time at the time, and I knew a lot about the products themselves. But I really had to learn on the hoof, as it were. As I say, I only had a couple of days. I think I I attended two independent sessions on internal auditing which is barely enough to give you even just the, the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of techniques. And I really learned it on the hoof to begin with. So in those early days, in the start of your career, how did you approach audits and what were, did audits look like and how did the auditees respond? Was auditing a, a recognised and understood and accepted practice in the industry in them days? I don't think it was, no, in, in all honesty. The approach was, yes, an agenda was put together, but it was not very regimented. The quality agreements at that time weren't particularly onerous in content. So in terms of a point of reference, all you had really was the specification for the product and the very loose commercial agreement that was in place with the company. As I say, I was starting to do these audits with a view to writing the the quality agreements. The the term QTA never really came into it, and quite often you had a technical manual and a separate quality agreement, and they weren't mixed in any way. The technical manual was probably five times the size of the quality (laughs) agreement. So, you know, in in terms of a, a document which you could refer back to, it was of minimal help, to be honest with you. What I was able to draw upon was... I had a, a senior manager, a QA manager, who had performed some audits, but he also himself had not had any, res- not received any formal training. So we we really learned together what was required, and I followed a logical process because I'm a very logical kind of person. Walking through these audits from cradle to grave, from the material receipt all the way through to final product out the door, and looking at each of those activities. And checking whether, you know, basically, were the procedures in place to document what was going on? And were they actually following them? And and that was as simple as that. And these things were quite often less than a day as well. Mm. You know, a morning or an afternoon was not unusual. And in the ISO guidance on auditing, which we use as the core substrate for our audit training programs, it puts lots of emphasis on setting the audit program and the definition of an audit program is a set of one or more audits to a specific time frame with a specific purpose so in them days what was your audit program how did you design the audit program or was it a reactionary system 
It was a very much a reactionary system, Peter. The, the, there was no programme. There was a list, there was a schedule that you had to adhere to in terms of these are the sites that you're going to visit. It was very often done on an annual basis back then as well. But it was very, very informal in terms of the programme. You just knew you had to do them. And normally it coincided with this is when the commercial director is going to make his yearly visit around these facilities. So you can tag along and perform an audit whilst he's discussing the commercial arrangements for the following year. And that was very much how it worked year in, year out. I knew I was never happy at the end of those that I had sufficient time and that there was sufficient preparation. And certainly there was no opportunity to look at things like complaints or deviations or change controls, even if such existed in those days. But there was very little insight before you actually walked in the door. And it was really very much reactionary based upon what you saw on the day. So no reference to standards, no conformance criteria, acceptance criteria. It was just a, what's your professional gut feel? Yeah, very much so. Very much. Uh, I mean, you knew the orange guide, the the, the guidance at the, that was in force at the time, and you knew what the requirements were. You had your own experiences at the organization that you were working for and very often it was just a gut feeling is this a, f a facility that is going to produce a product that meets the specification or is it not is it a facility that is going to produce a product that can cause harm and uh, it really was you you were flying by the seat of your pants quite literally so from your first experiences and your journey in auditing up until today how have you seen the auditing capability in the pharmaceutical industry change? Well, it, there is no comparison, quite frankly, to, the, to my early exposure. And, you know, I'd just like to just clarify, having lived that experience, I moved away and into contract manufacturing myself. So I was then really on the receiving end of, of, of audits. And I spent... Uh, I think it was more than nine years in contract manufacturing organizations. The standard of auditing varied. So you had the big multinationals with very disciplined teams and usually three or four auditors right the way down to the smaller companies that were doing business with you who would send along one auditor. You probably as ill-prepared as I was when I started in the auditing journey and it's transformed, quite frankly, and I think now, in particular, with respect to the RSSL course, it's just worlds apart from where it was. And had I known then what it could be like, I certainly would have been probably earlier to pursue a career in that, that area. But it took a gap of probably more than 10 years with a lot of training, a lot of, but not specifically in auditing, with a lot of exposure within the business and a lot of different roles before I thought, yeah, actually, I, I would like to take this up again as a, a an opportunity and as a career path. And uh, I really enjoy it now. I really do enjoy it. I think it's, it's a fantastic thing to be involved with. So for people listening to our little discussion today who are considering a journey in auditing to see it as a part of the value proposition of the quality role or a production role or a, just a pharmaceutical industry role on behalf of our patients. What skills and competence and experience should an aspiring auditor start to pursue to become an experienced auditor, to be competent, to be confident? Somebody on our course recently said, I'm really glad I came on this course. If it's one thing, it's allowed me to have the confidence to walk through the door, to sit down and say, hello, I'm the auditor. How can they get to that? Well, there is no excuse for experience. Um, you know, you really, I, I thoroughly advocate getting as much experience as you can under your belt. The opportunity to learn different parts of the business. So if you're working in QC and obviously the natural progression then would be into a QA role but look at operations look at uh, warehousing look at the validation team look at the engineering aspects look at the planning aspects so the more exposure you get 
the better. And I suppose the one big advantage I had is I worked for small or smaller contract manufacturing companies where you literally could be wearing 15 different hats in a single day. So you were very much exposed to the business and very much developed your business acumen because you were very much more, I would say vulnerable, but you were certainly, there was no bush to hide under in terms of decisions that you were making and the impact that that could have on the on the company. I suppose a distinct advantage is in the fact that I, I followed a career in microbiology and in analytical chemistry. So that naturally pushed me down the QC route and auditing laboratories and contract research organizations. However, I've also had the opportunity to work in invalidation in uh, regulatory affairs, technical transfer and operations as well. So the more experience you can get, the more rounded you are, because one thing I've found and one thing I'm often told during audits is, how would I get that kind of experience? How is it that you're able to talk about validation of an autoclave against the EN standards and well, what was HTM 2010 in one breath, and then the details of a training matrix in another, and then go and talk about how we control waste. How do you get that level of knowledge? And I think never stop learning, never stop asking questions, never stop requesting when you go around, if you're in your own facility, to go and be exposed to the different parts of the business and really develop your understanding of the entire business. There'll be certain things that pique your interest, of course, and, and validation was one of the things that piqued my interest, and sterile manufacturing in particular. But that's the way you develop that breadth, because you've got to have both depth and breadth, I think, to be a good auditor. You can be an SME, you can be a subject matter expert, you can be a technical expert in one particular area and support the audit function. But if you want to be a rounded auditor, you really have got to get that experience across many different disciplines. And that's quite a tough ask, especially if you're coming new into the industry, but it's something you can work towards and you can accompany audits as the SME or the technical expert and then expand your arena of knowledge on the basis of attending those audits. So, I would certainly share that from my personal experience in that I was fortunate I started in generics, I started in the laboratories, I tested everything in the formulary, I got a bit curious about, well, where are these tablets going or where are my merchanted tablets being manufactured coming from? And I started to understand the value of, actually, if I do an audit, I'm actually getting more experience. And this is, I suppose, it's a vicious circle. I don't have the experience without getting experience. And that's one of the key reasons why many of our, uh, our trainees come on our RSSL courses is to say, I've got to start somewhere, but it's a scary world out there to start doing an audit. So how can I get a bit of audit training and structure and process to give me the confidence to walk through that door and sit down and say, hello, I'm the auditor. And I think that's my experience is that it's that personal experience, that personal time served role but I guess in the 21st century, we much more diverse on our roles, smaller companies, and less of the huge corporation auditing teams. So I think you know my experience and my advice to anybody listening here wanting to start their audit journey is, yeah, get into a discipline, learn your specialism, but then auditing allows you to see the world. And you, every single time you audit, you get a bit more of experience. I'll write that and you reiterate it. Then you move on and you can see uh, the world differently. One of the areas that we do cover is self-inspections and internal audit. And whilst that's within your own company or within your own domain, you're still getting a lot of experience across that, that delivery chain, that manufacturing chain. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I think that's a really good way to start is get yourself on that uh, team that's uh, that's doing these self-inspections, internal audits. You'll get some training. And as as you say, Peter, you get exposed to different parts of the business. You'll see different parts of the business and how it works. You know, earlier on, you mentioned the fact that, you know, it's a bit scary. You, get, you go in as an auditor, but you can't get that experience without actually going and, and living that life for a bit. But also it helps you understand you now understand what you don't know. And, and that's a double-edged sword again, because yes, okay, then there's a vulnerability in your knowledge, which you can go and brush up on by talking to people, 
by you know studying the relevant literature or procedures or what have you look at the legislation but it also you know it picks your interest you think ah i need to know more about that so i'm going to go off and i'm going to find out a little bit more about whatever it might be validation of autoclaves I and mean, that's one thing that i again is one a particular favorite topic of mine now i didn't know a great deal about it but i sat down and i read hgm 2010 i was read 289 en 289 and i talked to a lot of people and i talked to some industry experts and i got involved in a few activities to do with autoclaves same with water systems as well i mean i I've lost count of the times I've spoken to SMEs in that area, some very well-known ones who have got some very successful companies, you know, and attend a few lectures, attend a few seminars mm. on it. And even if it's completely out of your comfort zone because you're thinking, well, I've never done anything on this, it's enough to try and turn up, listen to what you're not maybe going to be able to participate too much, but listen to what the industry experts are saying then go off and talk to your own people about it and find out a little bit more. And it's, it really opens up your world. It really does. Earlier on, if I'd had the benefit of attending a course such as uh, the, the IRCA uh, Lead Auditor Training course, it would have given me a lot more rigor and structure. I, as I've said to, <laughs> I said to you earlier on, Peter, it was really learning on the hoof. It mm. was just quite scandalous, really, if you, if you look at it in today's context but it, I guess it was fit for purpose at the time it, it served its its needs and certainly would have identified any serious concerns and arguably did um, back in the day I, I remember very well going into one facility and uh, seeing uh, some chromatograms coming off of the uh, HPLC equipment and looking at them and thinking well that's a little bit odd that 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 looks a little bit low so I, I asked to see a few more and I saw Gosh, it, it was the preservative system in the, that was also being assayed together with the, the active. And as you might imagine, the preservatives are very much more in, uh, in, in the minority compared to the active. And what I saw was being done was basically they were running the analysis seven or eight times and then taking an average. However, <laughs> that average also comprised data that was out of specification. So this was a classic example of, you know, averaging into specification. The client, uh, sorry, the uh, auditee came back to me, and it was actually the most senior person on site, and said, well, it's a rubbish method. We have to do that. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> you know, you absolutely know you cannot average into compliance. You, It's just you can't do it. So as a result of that and seeing that, um, walking through the laboratories, uh, the product got moved to another facility. So I think I had the common sense and enough knowledge to know yeah. what was right and what was wrong. But I think what's very nice about the, the IRCA course is it gives you that structure, that rigor, that consistency, and it gives you that confidence to, uh, as you said earlier on, Peter, to walk in the door and say, hi, I'm Adam, I'm the auditor, I'll be auditing you today against such and such and such and such and that imbibes a lot of confidence in in the individual and you, you know you've got that consistency of auditing because that's the other thing that very much worries me about what was done in the early days because various people were thrown into that um, melting pot of auditors i would imagine there's huge inconsistency in in the technical level and the competence and the breadth of the audits that were performed in those days because they really weren't done with a structured view in mind and quite often done by the qualified person who with the greatest of respect obviously had a great deal of knowledge in respect to the product but not perhaps in you know some of the subtle nuances of what might go on in a warehouse versus what might go on on a, on a packing line versus you know what goes on in in the sampling booth if they had a sampling booth back in those days and i, I do remember one particular facility that is still in existence and I wandered into the warehouse and there was a segregated area of warehouse with the old shutter boards uh, around a, a basically a pallet bay and I looked at that and there was a plastic curtain full-size curtain against it and a vacuum cleaner on top an old cylinder vacuum cleaner with a hole drilled in the top of the <laughs> of the uh, shutter board 
And uh, I said, what's that then? And they said, that's our sample booth. Oh. And I said, well, well what's the purpose of the uh, the vacuum cleaner? Oh, that's our extraction. <sighs> so, thankfully, we've come on a, a long way. A long way from that, <laughs> from those days. Thank goodness for that. Uh, and uh, I do remember next door to that was an IBC, uh, um, uh, uh, an international um, bulk container with um, a dark coloured liquid in it, which was mainly there to hold the shutterboard in place. And again, I asked, I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's my homebrew. Oh, <laughs> them were the days. <laughs> One of the exercises that we use on the, certainly on the Urca course, is what does good look like? Because the realisation in the delegates is, ah, a bit of planning actually helps. We do a lot of checklist preparation and mind mapping practice, etc., to give the, the, the delegates experience in pre-thinking and pre-shaping what you what you uh, what's what the standards at least and then we run them through one exercise to say okay you've got to audit this warehouse what would good look like so from your experience as an auditor and the process of auditing what does good auditing look like well good auditing and, and, and you know it's a really great question that because it, when you when you look at it and you say well what does good look like it's, it, it can be quite a hard hard question to answer but I think with with an audit you know you get this one opportunity if, if you get one day you're lucky if you get two days you're you're really gifted and you know you've got a really good situation if you've got two days if you've got three days it's absolute luxury that's not a reason to be complacent of course but it is all about preparation and one thing that I have learned and to my cost if I've, I've not done this properly is the more you prepare, the more you know about the process, the facility, the material that you're looking at, and all of those uh, factors that make to good audit, the easier it is, the more confidence you have, um, the better you can prepare your questions, the better you prepare your agenda, the better the use of the time, because it is very valuable time. Uh, it's expensive to send people thousands of miles, or even you know, even a few miles up the road, you're still taking somebody out of their their normal job you're still uh, stopping the activities at the facility as well for to support the audit so a good audit to me is one where you've done the preparation you're not going in without any real gaps in your knowledge in terms of what the material or the service that they're providing is it's clearly defined in the agenda what exactly you want to be looking at in result of a problem, of course, you clearly define what that problem is. Maybe you put a problem statement in there and, and said, you know, this is what I've got to address. And you it, you follow a very structured process and you can make that time that you have, that valuable, precious time, value added whilst you're there on site. So definitely a good audit is all about preparation, 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 definitely. I think that's a really good reflection and that's one of the training elements we put in our courses and you can't just do some background reading on the train or the plane and turn up and say hello i'm the auditor and, and use your gut feel so how can you reduce your stress as an auditor it is a high pressure environment it's a professional process there's lots of information but how can how can you avoid stress as an auditor I'm going to go back. I'm going to circle back to preparation. The more you prepare, the more you know, the more knowledge that you have. If you're talking to your audit client, you've had a brief with your client so you know exactly what the material is and the controls around it, any issues associated with it. And that should be a multidisciplinary brief as well, mm. not only just from the technical team, but the quality team and the operations team as well, and even the commercial team if it's appropriate that's going to put you in a more comfortable situation. I won't deny, and I think I said that to the to the delegates this week, that I still get butterflies the moment I walk in the door for those first few seconds until I'm, you know, firing on all cylinders and, and started. And I know, I know my process. I know what I'm going to be following. And the auditee is absolutely clear on what the day or the two days are going to look like or however long it might be. I'm then a lot more comfortable and I usually really relax into it as soon as you walk through that first part, which will probably be the warehouse because it's it starts at Goods Inn and I start looking around the warehouse and I feel a lot more relaxed then. I don't think it's ever stressless situation. 
and a certain amount of stress is not not a bad thing. It keeps you kind of sharp and focused and on your toes. But I think the more you prepare again and the more experience you get, the more confident you are in your own abilities. And of course, it's it's a bit like driving, Peter, isn't it? And I think, you know, my driving instructor said this to me many times, you'll pass your test and you put on a bit of an act for your test because you always, you never drive how you would drive on your driving test and then you'll start to learn to drive. And the same is true of auditing. You, you've got to get out there. So maybe in a, in a safer environment, you're with a, a lead auditor or you're observing uh, and you do a, you get a couple of audits tucked under your belt, you get a bit of experience, you identify what you don't know, you go away and you brush up on what you don't know and go and talk to people. Then you perhaps participate as a part of the audit team. And then you get the role of lead auditor, having passed the, uh, uh, obviously the ERCA course and the, and the tr appropriate training. And then you are in a much more comfortable I think that's really good reflection because what you know what I say as well is this week you're being trained. Next week you start to develop your competence yeah. by actually doing and walking it, but it's giving you the confidence and the process under your arm to give you that structure rather than that randomness. We know that in studies, you know, stress is induced by not knowing what you're doing a lot of the time. So as long as you know and you're prepared, auditing is your role. It shouldn't be any less stressful than doing the validation or doing your production or doing your QA review, etc. It is an interaction with another person. And I think that's that humanistic element where we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be made to feel inferior or caught out. But it's a preparation and that practice combined together delivers competence. Yes, you're absolutely spot on. It's it's that human trait of 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 feeling caught out and embarrassed. You know, it's it's the the age old dream which I'm sure we've all had, where you you turn up to school or somewhere important and you're still wearing your slippers. You know, I think what this this course gives you is that the likelihood of you turning up in your pajamas or your slippers it, it it's taken away because you you've given a structured way in which to organize and plan the audit and as you say peter in in cases and they are seldom it's happened to me on a couple of occasions where i've had to suspend an audit but you know exactly what to do you know exactly what the implications are you know how to convey and conduct yourself in those circumstances and you can make that judgment call because you're perfectly empowered and perfectly equipped to be able to decide hang on we're going to have to stop here because whatever the issue is you found and you know exactly what path to follow on in respect to that particular event occurring and would stress though it doesn't happen that often thankfully so we're on day three of our urca lead auditor course the teams are busy doing their stage one documentation review and they've got to give an opening meeting and then the the assessment and the closing meeting to us as tutors in character tomorrow and from my experience of the previous courses that we run, the delegates come out on a high at the end of that. We've done it. I've achieved it. I, I know more today than I did the other day. And we, we had in, in, in the discussion today, that's what one of the delegates said. Actually, the audit that we did yesterday, we were all over the place. We didn't know what we were doing. It's designed to disrupt. And because you haven't done your preparation, today we're prepared. Today we were confident. Today we were calm and we knew what we're doing that's a good feeling and I think that's really what it's about competence development is training experience feedback as well amongst your peers and that's really what we're doing this week you know, we've got 12 delegates on our course who are really working together as a team giving each other support and feedback and learning from each other as well and what better way to learn a, a new skill and be confident in it yeah that, it, that's right. It, it is a journey. You know, that the coaching and the mentoring that uh, that uh, the delegates are getting. Day one, as you said, people were a little bit scattergun. They were, uh, there was no organization. There's no, there's no logic to what they were doing. They were diving down rabbit holes. <laughs> but even, even later on in the day, I saw a more structured approach. And I, I was thoroughly impressed, actually. I, I thought, to, to myself, my gosh, they're going to make some really good auditors, these people, because 
they were starting to say, okay, this is the principal issue. This is what I found, and this is the clause and uh, you know the regulation where there is a potentially a nonconformance. But I'd also like to bring in the fact that the, this is implicated, and you know, there's another part of the regulations which uh, also I need to get more information on because I think potentially. There is also an observation here as well. And I was very, very impressed with the way they were thinking quite laterally across multiple different areas of the standards and regulations. And I thought that's that's very, very impressive this early on. I know some of them had done a little bit of auditing before, but some of them are relatively new to it. And they all, as a, as a team, fed back in, you know, the, this kind of yeah, okay, this is the principal concern, but also we have concerns in these areas, or not concerns, but uh, non-conformances, potential observations in these areas as well. And that was really, really impressive. And they've massively grown in in just, what, three days. It, it's it's phenomenal. That's a really good observation because, yeah, we you, you partic- in particular noticed it. The case study that we give them is a very focused on three elements, and they were trying to say, but it's also impact data integrity. I, it also impacts Q10, etc. And whilst they were absolutely right, you know, we were we were as tutors trying to say, just follow that brief. Actually, no, you're right. And you're starting to knit things together and demonstrating that they're growing a bit more in their breadth of knowledge and impact assessment across. I find one thing: what is it impacting across all areas of uh, of the requirement? Yeah. I, that, that that to me it really blew me away. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm probably emphasising it a lot, but you know that's precisely the auditing skill that you need because it is only a sampling exercise. Yeah. It's just a snapshot. You're there on one day or two days if you're lucky, three if you're very very lucky, and you you've got a limited opportunity to identify if there's something principally going wrong and not in compliance. And if you do find a particular area. If they're already thinking, ah, it's impacting this, it's impacting that, I need to gather more information to see how big the extent of this issue is. That's just total auditor thinking. And yeah. that, that That's the way our regulators audit us uh, or inspect us. And uh, I was very, very impressed with that kind of behavior. That's, that's really great. It's just a real privilege to be a tutor on this course, isn't it? To see people grow. We love paying it forward. They love listening to our stories <laughs> uh, of experiences, uh, good and bad. People learn from my mistakes as well, but it's been fun. And uh, it's a real pleasure to work with you this week and uh, see people grow. And that's all we can ask for, really, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I've got a lot out of this, if I may say so. It's helped me, in many respects, validate what I'm doing. I will come away from this experience thinking, actually, I'm (laughs) not a million miles (laughs) away from uh, what I should have been doing or what I am doing. It's validating what I'm doing. It's also helped me identify a couple of areas where I think, ah, yeah, I need to, you know, refine and hone that. I've gained a lot from the, the delegates themselves and their experiences and I can see that they've gained a lot from yourself, Peter, and and hopefully a little bit from me as well. But it's been a very enriching experience for me. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to to join you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully those listening have enjoyed our little journey in auditing uh, over the years and our experiences. And we, uh, we welcome you to the next course, Adam, for the next generation auditors. It's been a real pleasure. If you'd like to know more about our RSSL audit career path, we do audit training in internal auditing. We've got the IRCA flagship IRCA lead audit, of course, that's the one we're running this week. We do consultancy and we work in-house with teams because we're passionate about auditing. We want to really send the big message out there that it's actually fun. If you prepared, if you're trained, if you're competent, your experience that's when it starts to become fun we got a round of applause and a cheer from one of the exercises today where the auditees were were just buzzing from the learning experience that they've got so uh, thank you very much for your time today adam it's been really interesting to chat thank you peter thank you been fun